Speaking of Courage podcast. Back in studio. What's up, Chase? Yeah, not a whole lot, man. Special uh, 9-11 episode. 9-11. God, isn't that weird that it's been that long? Hard to believe. 20 years. Today, we're going to hopefully have this up on the date, but 20 years since 9-11, 2001. That is insane. Mm-hmm. Where were you? High school, man. I was, yeah? I was driving to school. I was waking up in the morning. You know, yeah. You were probably still asleep. <laughs> no, you I was, graduated? I, yeah, I was, gradu- I was working for a lumberyard. Right, I had I a, a flatbed. I was driving to downtown LA, yeah, and I was listening to Howard Stern oh, on God. a three-hour delay, and Howard's in New York City as it's happening, so I'm thinking it's happening, yeah. And he's the way that I didn't even know what the World Trade Centers were, right? And uh, the way Howard and the guys in the studio were responding to it, I knew it was like really, really bad. So yeah. I just followed. If if people haven't listened, whether you're a Howard Stern fan or not, the 9/11 Howard Stern show is pretty compelling, man. Just it's a piece of history. For it me, is, or... man, because it happens in real time yeah. while they're on the air. And to hear Howard like put the comedy stuff aside and really like address, he's getting calls from all over the city from veterans. And, you know, a lot of veterans called in that morning to like describe what was going on right. and like what kind of jets they, and just to remember all the rumors. Exactly. And, and the was, fear, remember? It, and it was interesting to, to listen back. I just listened to it not too long ago. And to hear what George W. Bush's mm-hmm. reputation was at that time, exactly. it was, oh, he's not going to do anything. Mm-hmm. He's, a, he's not going to do a damn thing to these people, and he's just going to let them bomb us. And it's funny how that... Those, those moments in history, those are ones we were part of. And for us, this is, you know, it's been a part of our lives, obviously. Absolutely. And all of our friends, we grew up with it. But some of the people, you know, nowadays, I mean, if you were... You're, you're, if you were born around yeah. 9 11, you're 20 years old now, you know? Yeah. So there's people that are adults that have come of age. There's people in the military that were born after this yep. or that were just five or six and barely remember it. It seems but so for weird. Us, it was, you it's know, such a, a epic huge moment. moment. Not epic, but it's such a, a huge moment in our lives that it, I've tattooed people right. that don't have, that weren't alive and or they you, were babies. And see, I went to the army shortly after that, right? Yeah. So what you, it, to me, I was getting ready for school and I, my dad ran in the room and Chase, are you watching the news? You know? Yeah. And I said, yeah. And then he turned it on. So I tried to turn it on or he called me from work actually, which he never did. And that uh, she had a plane crashed into towers. And initially they were talking like it was a propeller yes. plane, like it was just a little plane. Yeah. A lot of people thought went, it was a okay. Cessna. So I went and I finished my shower. And then when I came back, it was, oh my God, a plane's hit the second tower. It was just, you know, yep. the whole world literally changed. That was the interesting part for people that didn't don't that weren't alive at the time the first plane it was a crystal clear tuesday morning right Mm -hmm. and uh people were like oh a drunk pilot or yeah but it was kind of in the back of your head like i don't know Mm -hmm. and then so most people were watching the news and saw the second plane hit right and we you know it's it's that's there's few moments in your life that you're going to remember forever and i'm sure everyone has their moments you know and that's what's going to be on the news all day and all week where were you our grandparents are, talked about that jfk exactly. pearl harbor, pearl two harbor. Prior to that but that's it and and you watched history unfold and you knew you were a part of it and again from the feelings in the morning to the feelings in the afternoon kyle and i went and uh, we left school and went to donate blood and we waited in line for five hours to yeah. donate blood you know not realizing that blood's not going to do anyone any good because there was nothing left yeah them. and then um when i went in the army Everybody that was in the army at that time was post 9 11 guy, you know, guys yeah. that were there to fight for their country. I was in the same battalion as Pat Tillman. Remember, Pat oh, Tillman? were you? Yeah. yeah, he was Bravo Company. I was Echo Company. You know, I crossed paths with him a few times. That's a guy. Th- those are those. It galvanized iconic, the entire nation. Exactly. It was a different time that we're not going to likely see again. Yeah. It was a time when literally, and this sounds stupid, but people had American flags on their houses. And people their were making a fortune. On the side of the freeway <laughs> selling, I remember the little window flags that you rolled yeah. up into your window. Everybody had them. But people were friendly. And oh, people it was were amazing. better to each other. Yeah. And there were people in, the, you'd get in a car accident and they'd hug each other yep. and people would just, just stop on the street. It, it was, changed it sounds, culture immediately. It sounds like, like a fantasy that never happened. But just, just a few months later when we went to war, it all turned into the bickering and fighting. But for a brief moment in time. A couple months, it was it like. It was about being proud. It all the about, sporting events. Like yep. I remember Tito Ortiz fought in the UFC yeah. and came out with the American flag and it was like a big moment. It, was, it might have been that weekend. Might have been. Uh, the Patriots won the Super Bowl that yeah. year. Um, there was just like a few moments during that year, but he's right. Like, uh, the, the unity of the country, all the bickering stuff subsided immediately yep. that, that day. And it was just like, oh man, we just got punched in the people, face. People looked at the big picture and took account of their lives. Yep. It was like, like military guys coming home. People were thinking this isn't really that big of a deal. You know, I don't care because look what happened to these other people. Yeah. You know, I, so, so I crashed my car. It's not that big of a deal. Yep. And the grand, the whole collective world, you know, or at least in the United States, 
suffered a trauma together. And the, yep. the people in New York literally experienced the trauma, you know. The, a whole city was looking up at buildings as people were jumping out of the windows. They, it was like witnessing, yeah. like a huge metropolitan area witnessing like one of the most catastrophic yep. events in history. And There's we, no way to avoid it. We always talk about World War II. What did they think? What did, I distinctly remember, is this a military attack? What organization planned yep. this? You know, within a few hours, they had Bin Laden's picture up. So is yep. there, there going to be more attacks? Is this the first wave? Are planes going to be going down? People were stranded all over the country because the airlines went down and it was it was there was rumors everywhere there's still like 30 planes in the air i was on my way to la and my and i was listening to the radio and they were like oh there's planes headed toward la yep so i remember calling my boss and going dude i am not going to los angeles he's like uh yes you are (laughs) so i did but yeah i mean the rumors were crazy man yep just people in the military getting ready to get deployed had some friends uh, in the national guard brothers friends that they started they got sent to airports and uh, guys uh, that I was in the army with later at Fort Hood told me, but their experiences, they were on Fort Hood and they sent them to the perimeter. They all had their rifles and they didn't give them any ammo and they're standing guard and they're all scared because no one knows what's going on. Yeah. You know? It was and a they, scary day. It was a, it was a confusing time that galvanized the U.S. It was just an interesting thing. And that yeah. was 20 years ago. Yeah. And that's, that's largely shaped our lives, whether you were directly impacted by it or not because of that. It doesn't seem like it's possible that it was 20 years ago, but on the other hand, it does. But Right. But think about those born in the shadow of 9-11. They've known nothing but war as a constant. Yeah. Prior to that, our, our childhood, we remember Desert Storm, which was yeah. just a quick, you know, four-day war yep. as far as we saw it as kids. Obviously, there was more to it. But to the children born 1995 and after, that's all they've known until the, you know, Yeah, it's an interesting right now, thing, yeah. Think about it after way. Desert Storm, I remember my mom took us out to the base out at March. I think it was March, Air Force Base, to Likely, welcome yeah. the troops home. I remember getting like a cool flashlight from one of the soldiers and like yeah. they would give us our give the kids the gear. Mm-hmm. It was cool. But yeah, 9/11 was a huge man. To live through that was crazy. It doesn't feel like it was a big deal at the, I mean it felt big, yeah. but it didn't. Now you look back on it and you're like, man. Now it takes its place in history alongside to live, those other events. Yeah, to live through that. We I had a lot of friends and clients that flew to New York, you know, right. to go help the cleanup and the firefighters from yep. all over. We had uh, some from Redlands going over there and everything. Yeah. yeah. It was a crazy deal, man. And then I hear I don't know if you've been to New York, have you? No, I don't plan on it. But uh, yeah, I don't either, either but <laughs> J, uh, James Diaz, my buddy, went mm-hmm. up there and he goes, "Man, did, you don't really understand like the impact of it till right. you're in the city looking mm-hmm. up and going, oh, "Damn, how did these buildings come like this doesn't even seem like there's room for that right and there's you know? there's a million stories from yeah. that day there's a million stories from the guys that were in the buildings the guys that were you know in pennsylvania guys all over the country guys that were just watching on on tv there's a million stories and today we're going to tell one 9-11 story oh okay cool okay so where are we headed all right so you might be wondering uh, what well, we have a vietnam uniform uh, yeah. back here but we're going to go back a little bit even before that so today we're going to tell the story of a uh, rick rescorla some of you guys might have heard of him. If you know me, I might have told you a story in the past or showed you some videos on him. But Rick Rescorla is one of those legendary type, uh, Ernest Hemingway type characters, almost a warrior poet that only comes around once in a lifetime. Right. Uh, Rick was born in um, Cornwall in, this, in the uh, southwest corner of England in 1939. So he's Cornish by ethnicity or yeah. by, by cultural group, but he's English. He's from the UK. May 27th, 1939. He was the only child of a single mom. But he didn't really know that. He thought he had an older brother and sister, and then he thought his grandparents were his parents. Oh, wow. But it turns out that was his sister was his mom, and he never knew his dad. Okay. Damn. So one of those um, stories that are somewhat common and sometimes breached over. But despite that, he had a good life. Uh, he called his, his mother sis his whole life. And, yeah. he, and like I said, he never knew his dad. But he grew up being born 1939 in England. September 1st, 1939 was when World War II started, and the UK was under that threat the whole time. So he's going to be growing up under the threat of invasion in the UK. Yeah. Despite that, though, like I said, he has a fairly happy life. He's going to be, uh, I believe it's t- pronounced Hale. It's a working class tin mining town, which is where he's going to be born, kind of those rough British stock. Um, and, and he's from a working class family. The family was poor. But he still got money to go to the movies every week, you know, from his parents or his, his grandparents, which yeah. we'll, we'll call his parents. And like a lot of kids at the time, he was obsessed with America. So when he would get money, he'd go to the movies and he'd watch Westerns and he'd watch the, you know, Casablanca and these stories. And he, he fell in love with America at a young age. Okay. Another big part of that, though, which is the huge part, when we were prepping for the invasion of mainland Europe, all of our troops were stationed all over England. Yep. The 29th Infantry Division was stationed in his town, and, okay. and they were um, the Blue and Gray Division. They were from uh, Maryland and the, uh, the, the South and the North. They were a combined unit, and they're the ones that landed on D-Day. They were a National Guard unit. So a lot of the British kids looked up to these American soldiers. They had their own soldiers, but our soldiers, you know, they spoke cool, and they had that American music, yeah. and, the, and they, that style and that swagger, and they had a little more money. 
Have you ever heard the uh, the the British fa- phrase? We were uh, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Yeah. And then the Americans responded that the British were underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the British or the American, I'm sorry, the British kids were just uh, you know mesmerized by these guys. They were they looked up to him like they were superheroes. So right away he wanted to be an American, and he kind of wanted to be a soldier. He looked up to this life and adventure. It was so much so that his uh, nickname was a kid. It was Tammy. There was an American boxer by the name of Tammy who was fighting a British uh, boxer. And all the kids in the neighborhood were going for the Brit. And Rick said, I'm for Tammy. So they started calling him Tammy because he idolized the Americans so much. Growing up, he was a tough kid. He played a lot of sports. He got a school record for shot put. Uh, He played rugby like a lot of the the British kids did. And he was a boxer. So one of the... uh, Oh, he actually went into boxing, too, As huh? a kid, yeah. yeah. So he's just, like I said, he reminds me of one of those Ernest Hemingway type characters or a Teddy Roosevelt, just always looking for a challenge and looking for a fight, even, even as a little kid. Okay. He was described by one of the uh, townspeople as a natural number one man, a broad-shouldered, curly-haired man-child who wowed the girls and led the boys. Rescorla, known then as Tammy, was also a talented, hyper-competitive rugby, rugby player. So that's what he came of age in. Yeah. In the shadow of the war, you're seeing the British boys go off to war and there's no men around in the towns, and you're seeing the Americans take their place, and you're hearing these stories, and you're listening to the news on the radio. Yeah. It's just a crazy time. And in the UK, in, in England, they were suffering from the Blitz in London, so the kids from London had to go live in the countryside. So it was a, you know, a terrible time. time to grow up, but in some ways it was an adventure to them. Yeah. So when he came of age around 1956, when he was 16 or 17, he left his hometown to join the uh, British Army, of course, because that's going to be that, that role he's going to take, right? There was conscription at the time, but he went ahead and enlisted, so he ended up doing a uh, three-year tour. Being the kind of guy he was, he volunteered to be a paratrooper, so he became a British paratrooper, and he served during the insurgency in uh, Cyprus off the coast of Greece from 1957 to 1960. Oh, okay. So he saw some sporadic action there. Um, these are these little insurgencies that, that are calm, it's constantly going on, especially during that time in history yeah. with a lot of the British uh, colonies and protected started taking their, their rights back and trying to be their own nations. He was sent to one of those. So while on Cyprus, he started to develop this lifelong hatred of communism yeah. and um, kind of seeing the reality of this war. After he finished his tour, he, didn't, he was still looking for adventure. He hadn't had enough excitement. So he ended up going to Rhodesia. He served as a uh, commando in the Northern Rhodesian Police, and that's in Africa at Zambia now. Damn. And this is, there's, there's the old posters, be a man among men, join the Rhodesian army, you know. So yeah. this is, again, think of how exotic that would be in the, in the uh, early oh, 1960s, crazy. late 1950s. He's been to the, you know, in sporadic combat off the islands of Greece. He, now he's in Africa. He's serving yeah. as a commando. He's serving as an intelligence offer, an officer in all these weird, you know, time that's going on, and there's all this constant threats. He, uh, he killed a lion with a rifle, and Holy he, he wore the uh, lion's claws around his neck <laughs> along with the bullet, you know. Just one of those larger-than-life characters, almost. Yeah. While he was in Rhodesia, he actually met an American by the name of Daniel J. Hill, who was a mercenary that was over there. He was a commando, probably working for the government. He had been in fighting all over the world, and they ended up becoming lifelong friends. Um, Hill actually convinced him you should come to America and join the U.S. Army, right? Because yeah. Rescorla is still thirsting for adventure and his time's almost up and he's kind of a wayward soul and he's looked up to America all this time. So Hill's telling him, you know... Get over here. Hill was an Airborne Ranger, you know, at the time he was a civilian, but he really wasn't, you know? Yeah. He's saying, hey, if you, ever, if you ever get a chance, you should join the U.S. Army. So when, when Rescorla finished up in Rhodesia, he ended up going back to uh, the U.K. and he decided he was going to be a cop, basically. So he joined the uh, Metropolitan Police Service and served on uh, Scotland Yard, but he got bored with the paperwork, and he thought the job wasn't basically yeah. exciting for him enough. So he, did, he ended up taking that leap. He decided he's going to leave everything he knows back home, and he's going to go to the United States, and he's going to join the U.S. Army, which is <laughs> he's already lived a life where he's served during two, two... Can you join the military like that? Yeah. Really? From yeah, another country? We have a lot of foreigners in the U.S. Army. Really? It's a path to citizenship. And oh, yeah, cases. we've talked about that. And yeah. Then, yeah, and then other people, they, they never actually get their citizenship. But we've had a couple on the show that haven't yeah. been citizens. Yeah, forever. yeah. So in 1963, he ended up moving to the United States. When he got here, he didn't really know anybody. He didn't have anywhere to go. So he was living in a YMCA hostel in Brooklyn. Damn. (laughs) You know, that shows how much effort he's putting into this. Yeah. Until he could join the Army. And he ended up getting accepted in the Army in 1963. He sounds pretty comfortable being uncomfortable. He's he's just, like I said, a warrior poet. He's a brilliant guy. He could quote Shakespeare. He could tell you, you know, the poems of of Rudyard Kipling. But he he just thirsted for action. But he also believed in these things. He wasn't just a, you know, a violent killer. He believed in these causes. And he believed in fighting for what he perceived as the right against these, these foreign forces. 
So he ended up going to basic training at Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey. And this is 1963. We're right on the dawn of that Vietnam War, yeah. right? Because of his combat experience and because of his, you know, his intelligence, they ended up sending him to Officers Candidate School and then Fort, ba- uh, Fort Benning, Georgia for Airborne School. While he's in Officers Candidate School, all these other guys, they're badasses too, but most of these guys are young, right? They're 18, 19, 20. They've never been to combat. He's been into two, two combat deployments. How old is he at this point? Uh, he was born in 39, and this is 63, so if you want, he's about 24 years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so he's a little older. He's about 20, 24 years old, but he's also... He's he's, been he has this life experience. So one of the other guys were struggling, he was picking them back up. And when the other guys were, you know, if they'd knock out 50 push-ups, he'd knock out 60. But the big thing that people remember for him was his singing. You know, think of British soccer fans. Yeah. You, he was constantly singing. He had this rich baritone voice, and he would sing these ancient songs and these military songs and these marches. So everyone that went to OCS with him remembers, you know, when they were feeling down and they were beat and they can't go on, he'd start piping up and singing, and it would bring them this kind of this swelling of the pride. So he was just a natural leader in that. Does that kind of singing stuff help? Yeah, so uh, singing, it can help morale, but, I mean, when you run, you sing cadence. There's a number of reasons for that. One of it is it opens your lungs up, right? Two is it makes you forget about the pain, and three is it keeps you in a rhythm and driving forward. So when you start to sing, if you have the lungs to do it, it's going to take you out of what you're doing, and then... You've, you've been to UFC matches where there's yeah. British fighters, right? And you start ole, to feel that. Yeah, or like, Conor McGregor like, fights exactly. was the craziest. Deafening, dude. That ole, 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 ole. Now imagine if you were the fighter, if you're Conor McGregor, oh, your man. fans are doing that. Now imagine if you're a soldier and you're down and he starts singing. Yeah. Right? And you kind of forget and you kind of want to strive forward. It so pumps you up, dude. Thing. There's a lot of warriors that sing. You know, the Zulus would chant, the Native Americans. Yeah. Like, they, you drive yourself up. So that's what he's doing. So just that, that, that command presence there in any situation yeah and it's almost scoffing at that the hardships i'm singing through this yeah so he ends up graduating obviously and he becomes a platoon leader and he's assigned to the second battalion seventh cavalry regiment guess what unit that's in greatest fighting force in the history of the world what first cavalry? first cavalry yeah. division all right so he joins the seventh <laughs> cavalry the first cavalry division and for those of you guys that have seen we were soldiers donnie hasn't yeah, of course um not. yeah that's going to be the battle of the idrang the idrang valley which is where he's going to take part so the first cavalry division was legendary in vietnam this is early in the war 1964 1965 they're developing the air mobile concept which is rather than pushing forward a front line, rather than moving forward in tanks, you're taking the helicopters and you're just landing anywhere you want, getting out and trying to seize an area. So it's very dangerous because you're putting the enemy in front of you and behind you. Yeah. And if you, you can only fit so many people on a helicopter. So if you land 100 people, it takes the helicopters a half hour to get there and back again. That's 100 people are alone at that time. Mm-hmm. But this is that unit that he's going to be in. So they're going to be formed and sent over as a division. And, and the enemy is, knows where you're at, knows oh, yeah. where you landed. Later, they, they would count the rotor blades, and they could tell exactly how many people were going to be coming in, and they'd know if they could cut your area off or if they should retreat and hide, you know, based yeah. on how many people are there. So it's it's... A dangerous concept, but it's also perfect for a guy that's looking for adventure and Hell, that, that yeah. traveled across the sea to do so. Yeah. Right? As a leader, Rescorla demanded excellence. We've talked about a lot of these on these shows. He was one of those guys that you didn't want to be in his unit because you were going to be hurting in peacetime, but you wanted to be in his unit in combat because they were going to be the best, and he accepted nothing less. If the other units were running five miles, the, his platoon was running 10. If the other units were staying up till nine, he was staying up till 10. And it would drive them crazy because, you know, you're looking around and you're going, how come they're off and we're over here? But it molds you into a unit. Yeah. And it molds you into... We're bad at... We're it, better. Everywhere they went, they were running. Like, you don't walk to the chow hall, you run to the chow hall. You don't walk to the barracks, you run to the barracks. Why? Because you're training for war. You yeah. don't want to die. So they... They begrudgingly respected him. You know, yeah. you 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 don't like it at the time. They complained initially, but their their training paid off, and, and it paid off dividends in in combat. Again, this is early in the war, 1965. When they were sent to Vietnam, they were sent as a unit, and they actually took World War II transport ships over, which is weird when you yeah. think about Vietnam. We always talk about the combat landings. They took these ships over, so all the enlisted guys were in hammocks. They were, you know, crammed in everywhere, and the officers got little rooms. They were cramped, shitty little rooms, but there was four beds and only two officers in each room. So Rescorla, being the kind of guy he was, he's got two empty mattresses, so he went to the troops, and every night he'd let two of them sleep in there, and then the next night two more, and then the next night two more. Oh, that's cool. So they started respecting him, and his his reputation grew right away, and and that's just the kind of person he is, you know. And he's serving under the legendary Hal Moore, who, again, if you've seen We Were Soldiers or anything... And, and Hal Moore has an immediate respect for him, too, which is kind of like, you know, having Hoist Gracie respect you as yeah. your jujitsu skills, if you want to uh, reference it to that. During downtime on the ship, most guys were playing cards, 
writing letters or bullshitting. He was studying Vietnamese culture and French cult or uh, French language and Vietnamese language. So he's all in, dude. He's all in. He's 100%. He knows what combat is, and he knows where they're going. He knows it's not a joke, and he wants to be the best he can be. He's done everything he can to get here, so he's going to make himself the best in that. The ship to Vietnam took one month. <laughs> so it took him a month of this misery, but eventually they were going to get there, and they end up in the uh, central highlands of Vietnam. When you watch Vietnam movies... You know, you think of the thick jungle and all yep. that on the Delta. The, the Central Highlands weren't like that. There was jungle, but it was green pastures in a lot of places. Um, it was a very different style of warfare. And, the, and in, uh, when they ended up on November 14th, 1965 at LZ X-Ray, this is going to be the Battle of the Idrang Valley. This is the first major engagement between U.S. troops and NVA troops. This is the first time we've had a massive force-on-force -force fight. So basically, the 7th Cavalry... Rescorla's unit, they were looking for a fight. They're going and looking for the Vietnamese, expecting them to run like they had been for the most part. Well, yeah. we didn't realize there was three battalions of Vietnamese waiting for us, and they wanted their crack at the Americans, too. Damn. So we ended up landing American uh, troops on a search and destroy uh, mission. They basically ran into an enemy base, which was a mountain. I think it's the Chupong Mountain, which is a whole mountain fortress with underground tunnels <laughs> that was basically waiting for them. Three battalions of enemy were waiting on the Chupong Mountains, and we walked into that, essentially. So American troops that first night were encircled, completely encircled. The first units that were there in a, a horrendous firefight. They're pinned down. We're trying to get troops into them. They had to close the landing, uh, the, the landing zone because they were going to get killed if they came in. So these guys were just fighting for their lives. They're cut off. In some places, they had 50% casualties. There's hand-to-hand -hand fighting. There was a lost platoon that was separated. It was just horrendous. This worst first, case scenario. Worst case scenario. It, they, they called the, a broken arrow, meaning they're... The troop, the enemies in our line, again, we can't call artillery, we can't call anything, that's how bad it was. Rescordo wasn't there that first night, he came in the next night. Him yeah. and his unit landed to replace the perimeter unit, basically to relieve these guys in place and to allow them to get back and get the wounded out. He later recalled that when he arrived, a U.S. jet had mistakenly dropped napalm on their own men, so there was Americans Shit. that were killed by the napalm, and Rescorla found corpses scattered, scattered everywhere from the night before, including an American with his hand still clenched around the North Vietnamese soldier's throat. So there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and the, the napalm had been dropped on him, so they're landing into this hellscape where there's literally dead, charred bodies embraced in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So that's, that's wow. how they arrive. As soon as they land, the guys they're relieving are terrified, and the guys that he's bringing in are terrified, but Rescorla's calm. Rescorla actually left their perimeter, and he moved out into the enemy's area. The enemy wasn't there at the time. 50 meters into the front, risking sniper fire, risking machine gun fire, so he could turn around and see what the enemy saw, so he could see where their weak spots were, right? Damn. So instead of digging in and hunkering down and being scared, he went out and he looked, and he said, all right, guys, you need to move the perimeter back. This isn't a good perimeter, because I can see what the enemy says. He starts telling him, put your wire up here, put your booby traps here, put the claymore here, whatever that's going to be. You know, He's risking all that stuff. But smart guy, huh? He's genius and he has the courage behind it. Yeah. So, again, that Hal Moore called him the greatest battlefield commander he'd ever seen. He's putting himself out for his guys, so they're respecting him. So, they did what they were told and they, uh, they, they followed his commands. While they were digging in that night, everyone was scared and everyone was trembling. Some of the soldiers that had been on the line were literally shaking. And then they heard Rescorla singing. Up and down the lines, Rescorla started singing. Men of Harlech was his favorite song, which is a defiant battle song from the, the uh, uh, Cornish songs he was singing to raise morale. Larry Gwynn, one of the soldiers, was there later said, I saw Rick Rescorla come swaggering into our lines with a smile on his face and an M79 on his shoulder and an M16 in one hand saying, good, good, good. I hope they hit us with everything they've got. We'll wipe them out. His spirit was catching. The enemy must have thought an entire ba battalion was coming to help because of all of the screaming and yelling. So people are cheering are like a football locker room. He's walking around laughing and smiling and going, come on, I hope they attack us. Let them bring it on, guys. We're yeah. going to kill them. And he's, he's smiling and he's singing, right? So yeah. everybody's starting to get pumped up and they're cheering and they're being soldiers again. They're not being victims. They're not afraid. Now they want that fight that they were hoping for. They remember who they are. They get their courage back in a sense. The men on the line prepared for another attack. They're tired, but he kept their spirits high. And then as the, you know, they're waiting longer and longer and their adrenaline starts to go at midnight, he piped up with some more corner songs to kind of keep that melody flowing and keep that vibe. One of the soldiers remembers, again, Lund, remembered Rescorla stopping by every foxhole to check on the guys. So he's checked on his, and he, he took his bayonet off, and he fixed his bayonet, and he critiqued his fields of fire. He said he was joking like they were getting ready to play paintball, not like they were in combat. Yeah. But how do you... 
how do you still have fear when you see this guy like yeah. this, right? And how do you not almost know? Almost playful. Uh, almost playful, but it's just, it's like a fathering figure. You know, like if, if you're a child and you're scared of the dark and you see your dad's with you, you're not scared anymore. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Whatever was there is still there, but you know your dad will protect yeah. you. Yeah. When you're scared and then Rescorla comes swaggering in, you you're know, like, it's yeah. just, this it's, ain't so it's bad. an awesome thing. You don't seem too worried. Lundstedt, in addition, he said, what a command presence. We all thought we were going to die that night and Rescorla gave us our courage back. Wow. I figured if he's walking around singing, the least I can do is stop trembling. Yeah. Right? He's literally shaking, thinking he's going to die that night for sure. And this guy's laughing and singing and walking and standing up straight. So it gave him his courage back. Think of how powerful of that of yeah, thing that man. is. All the leadership stories we talk about, he had lost his courage and now he had it back. Now he was ready to fight. We always talk about it. Calm breeds calm and courage breeds, yep. breeds courage. You know, you feel like out of place almost if everybody else is... is rising and you're fearing if everyone else is panicking you you feel justified in your panic but they weren't because of his actions so the next morning bravo company was attacked just like the night before the day before uh the other unit had been attacked they beat back four assaults they mowed down 200 of the enemy soldiers and they only had a few injuries in their lines because rescorla had fixed their positions because rescorla had ready them because he fixed their bayonets because he went through and he gave them their courage back yeah so rather than being annihilated or or massacred they fought they killed 200 of the enemy beat back four attacks and only had a few energy or a few injuries yeah after the fight there was a quietness over the field right because the attacks had been beat back they started putting rounds into the empty perimeter, and Rescorla killed a, sol- a Vietnamese soldier that tried to run away, and then a machine gun opened him up on them, and Rescorla killed him with a grenade close enough that brain matter was all over his, his own uniform. So you can imagine how these guys are looking up to him, you yeah. know? And, and this, this just, again, this, this force of nature. That He said the stench of death was just everywhere, and it stayed on his fatigues. The next day, Bravo Company got pulled out. They were relieved from the line after they had, you know done this heroic thing and they had finished this battle. Meanwhile, other troops were moved into an area called LZ Albany. Unfortunately, that unit got attacked and they were again cut off. So Rescorla's troops that had been pulled out and were supposed to be getting relieved were the only ones to be able to get sent back in. So they sent them back in. He told his battalion, he said, you know the battalion is in the shit. We've been selected to jump into that shit and pull them out. So once again, they did a combat landing. The helicopters covered about, hovered about 10 feet from the ground. Rescorla jumps off the helicopter under fire, and he runs into the unit, and he joins this unit into this Damn. ragged perimeter. He immediately lifts, starts lifting the soldier's spirits, right? He immediately starts walking around. He is quoted of using a, a quote from someone else saying, good, they've got us surrounded. Now we can attack in all directions, right? <laughs> so you're seeing <laughs> your a relief. a positive spin on everything. You're, you're seeing your relief, and it's just a handful of, you know, it's just one unit, but they're coming in ready to kick ass, right? Yeah. Your big brother's there, and he's swaggering. One of the soldiers said, my God, it was like the little bighorn. He was a reconnaissance pl- pl- platoon leader. He said, we were all cowering in the bottom of our foxholes, expecting to get overrun. Rescorla gave us courage to face the coming dawn. He looked me in the eye and he said, when the sun comes up, we're going to kick some ass. So basically, you yeah. know, again, these guys are just terrified. They're, they're letting their fears overtake them. They're forgetting what they're capable of and they're just seeing the worst. And now they see this big boisterous guy and he's singing and he's laughing and he's, and he's He's backing it up with his actions. He's killing the enemy, right? Yeah. So they have their courage back. He ended up getting the nickname Hardcore because nothing could shake him. He was just, you know, unflappable. And sure enough, with Rescorla's, you know, leadership, they ended up fighting their way out of Albany and surviving. The battle was horrendous. Uh, 305 Americans died in the Idrang Valley in this, this first major Damn. engagement, which is more than the, we lost in the entire Gulf War. We were talking about That's the crazy. Gulf War. And this one battle in this one unit. The North, to me and to me, North Vietnamese had over 3,000 casualties from the battle. Wow. So you can imagine what that battlefield would look like. That's crazy. And Rescorla never let his spirits die, or at least not in front of his men. He never showed them that. Yeah. They said that... Um, in the 7th Cavalry till this day, they still, still tell legends about Rescorla and the things he did during his year tour. One of the guys remembered that uh, they said he was a rock on the battlefield, steady and strong. And again, Hal Moore called him the best platoon leader I ever saw. And Hal Moore is a legend. He fought in Korea. He fought in Vietnam. He has, you know... He, so he's been around. He's one of the most... He's seen a lot of commanders. ...beloved battlefield leaders in history in the U.S. Army. And he says, this is the best platoon leader I've ever seen. The book, We Were Soldiers... On the cover of the book is Rick Rescorla. No way. Yeah, which is, you know, that was published a while back, and that he's on the cover of the book. One of the stories one of the soldiers remembers uh, telling long back, they said um, they were on a, on a reconnaissance patrol in Bonsong, and 
Rescorla actually stumbled into a, uh, an enemy bunker. He didn't know that the enemy was there, and he, rather than panicking or anything, he said, oh, pardon me, and then he fired shots into the enemy <laughs> and kept moving. So they thought it was so funny that he was so calm and just kind of his posh British nature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the book, Baptism. Sounds all like... Totally British, yeah, right? Very, yeah. very posh. Like oh, Piers Morgan. <laughs> oh, pardon me, like James Bond, yeah. yeah. In the book, uh, Baptism, the author actually dedicated an, an entire chapter just to Rescorla on, on how heroic he was. He described him as a charming with a crazed a reverent twinkle at play, but a ruthless killer with cold steely glint that could sear through you like an icy stare of death. So Damn. he's just that mix, you know, you can just, he's the most interesting man in the world. Yeah, yeah. Imagine being a young soldier in Vietnam and you're with this guy that's fought in Africa. He's fought in Greece. He's from Cornwall, England, you know, fearless. he's been a boxer. He's played rugby. Yeah. He's just, <laughs> he's just fearless. He's, you know, he's, he's doing funny things in combat. Yeah. How do you not look up to him? But he's not reckless. Right. He's exactly. reading, he's and learning he cares, languages. And he cares about his guys and he's looking out for his troops. Disciplined. So he ended up finishing his tour in Vietnam, and he went back to uh, Fort Benning, where he ended up learning his US, earning his U.S. citizenship, right. so becoming an American, which obviously he had a love for America. He never lost his love of home and his culture and his identity, yeah. but he loved the United States, and he became a citizen. He ended up leaving active duty in 1967, and he uh, reached the rank of colonel in the Army Reserves, and then he ended up retiring in 1990. While in Vietnam, he earned a Silver Star, two Bronze Stars, a Combat Infantry Badge, Damn. a Purple Heart, a number of awards, right? And these are at the leadership level. In other units, he might have even had higher awards. Yeah. The, the honor of being on the cover of We Were Soldiers is enough, especially if you are a first cow. Hell yeah. After Vietnam... Uh, Rescorla ended up going home. He went back to the uh, to school. He used his military benefits, and he ended up studying creative writing at the University of Oklahoma. He ended up getting a bachelor's of arts degree and then a master's of arts degree in English and his law degree from Oklahoma State. So damn, just you can just a go getter, man, you, a go getter, and, and think how intelligent he was. Yeah. And throughout his life, he was often in the library. He was studying. He was obsessed with Native American culture and legends and that warrior ethos, and you know. Warriors from past and cultures and all these things. Yeah. He's, he's constantly reading up on them. While at the University of Oklahoma, he met his first wife, uh, Betsy, and they were married in 1972. He ended up having two children with her. While raising his kids, he was a great father, of course. You know, he's just one of those people who took those things seriously. Yeah. He coached his kids' soccer team, watched movies with them. He liked Westerns. He liked John Wayne, probably from, you know, watching Westerns as a kid. He never yeah. lost that love for the idea of America, he, he, truth and fault, you know, truth yeah. and legend. And uh, so he, he liked that, that John Wayne type of stuff. He would edit his daughter's poetry and read, you know, he took poetry very seriously, took education very seriously. He would practice boxing with his son, just a good loving dad that was around. He actually co-wrote a screenplay about Audie Murphy, which, you know, was obviously nice. one of our favorites on the show. And from the parts that I've read that were referenced, it sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, but that was obviously never published or anything like that. For a time, he ended up teaching criminal justice at the University of South Carolina. He published a book on criminal justice. Damn. A renaissance man, yeah. if you will. But despite his success in teaching, uh, he didn't enjoy it. It wasn't exciting, and he wasn't really making enough money. You know? yeah. So he, he looked for uh, other, other options. He ended up getting a divorce with his wife after his children were grown. He waited until they were grown, and then they split up. And then he ended up working in corporate security. So as a security planner for these big corporations. He ended up moving to New Jersey, and he took a job with Dean Witter Reynolds at their offices at the World Trade Center in Manhattan, which is probably making sense how we're getting yeah. back here, right? So he's the head of security. He's in charge of planning. He's in charge of the safety of all these ploys. In 1998, I'm sorry, in 1988, there was a hijacking and bombing of plan, uh, Flight 103 over Scotland. So Rescorla is seeing the emergence of terrorism and international terrorism, and he starts worrying because he works at the World Trade Center. So he starts getting on board with there's going to be a terrorist attack at the World Trade Center because we're a big target, which it turned out they were. Yeah. This is 1988, mind you. And he's saying, we need to do something about this. So he thinks back to his old friend, Daniel Hill, who he met in Rhodesia and who he had served in the Army with and he had been friends with for a long time. Hill was an expert in counterterrorism. So he called Hill and he said, I want you to come to the World Trade Center with me and I want you to look around and if you were a terrorist, what would you do? So the two of them got together and they right. decided to assess the building security. So Hill said, okay, let's go down below. So they went down into the parking structure. And as they walked down, one of the first things they noticed in the basement was nobody stopped them. There was no security, there was no one there. So Hill looks around and he sees a load-bearing pillar. And he says... If I was a terrorist, I'd plant a bomb right there and I'd blow it up and I would take out the, uh, the support structure of this building, right? Yeah. He looks right at it and that's, that's the first thing that he says. He says, this is a soft touch. I would drive a truck full of explosives in here, I'd walk out and I'd light it off. So Rick follows his instructions and he immediately 
types up a big form. You know, he starts going, does a report on the weaknesses of the World Trade Center, and he submits it to the Port Authority, saying, we need more parking security, we need, we need eyes on this, we need to do something about this structure. And basically, they said it was too, anno- uh, too expensive, so they ignored him. February 26, 1993. Terrorists attacked the World Trade Center. With the they, exact same in way. In the exact same way that he said. They, they drove a truck bomb down and they detonated it on the North Tower, exactly as Helen Rescorla had said. Exactly where they said it would, right on that load-bearing column. The idea was the device was supposed to send the North Tower crashing into the South Tower and, and potentially kill thousands of people. Yeah. They were trying to knock out these towers, right? Fortunately, that didn't happen. It wasn't strong enough. It only killed six people, including a cre- pregnant woman. And it killed, uh, I'm sorry, it wounded uh, over 1,000 people. And on that day, there was panic and pandemonium, but Rick was calm, right? And Rick made sure he was the last person out of that building. He made sure everyone was good. He used his calm to calm everyone else down. Yeah. Subsequently to that, the uh, radical Muslim clerics based out of Brooklyn were convicted for the bombing. So it was, it was you know, Islamic terrorists who had tried to take this building down. So now Rick's in high gear. He's got a little respect now because people are starting to think, oh, that, that, all that crazy stuff he was saying is exactly what happened. So now they're giving him a little bit more power in his security job. So following that 1993 attack, he ends up inviting Hill to New York and hiring him as a security consultant. He's one of his deputies there, yeah. basically. And Rescorla, the first thing he tells Hill is he says, there's going to be an attack. There's going to be another attack on this building, and it's going to come from the air. He told Hill in 1993, they are going to attack this building by air, the World Trade Center. He expected a cargo plane, and he thought possibly loaded with chemical or biological weapons en route to the Middle East was going to intentionally crash into the Twin Towers and try to take them down in 1993. Damn. So with his credibility, he starts drafting another report. So he wants the company out of that building. He says, we can't defend this. I, you know, I'm responsible for all these employ- employees. These next attacks could send the towers down, and it's going to kill thousands of people. So he recommended that the, to his superiors at Morgan Stanley that they move to their Manhattan office and they go to New Jersey. He said, it's easier to defend, it's cheaper, you know, we're at a lower li- um, level building, we won't be as big of a threat. But their lease didn't end until 2006, so they told Rescorla, there's nothing we can do, basically. Suck it up, we're, we're going to be here, so, so do your job. Dean Witter and Morgan Stanley ended up merging, and their employees off, uh, occupied 22 floors on the South Tower and then several floors in a nearby building. So he's responsible for 22 floors, floors of this Of high-level executives. Of high-level executives, of low-level executives, of everybody that's, that's going to be in this building. And his office was on the 44th floor of the South Tower. Because they wouldn't let him move, he started doing what he could to prepare everybody. So he ended up installing generators and lights in the stairwells. And just like he had done it with his troops in Vietnam, he drilled them. He constantly made them prepare for the worst. So at Rescorla's assistance, all employees, including these senior executives, including these multi, multi, multi millionaires, they had to practice emergency evacuations every three months. Every three months, Rick would get Damn, on the bullhorn he was diligent. and he would make them go down the stairs from the 44th floor all the way down, right? Or from wherever they were. He trained them to meet in the hallways and go down two at a time so they weren't trampling each other. Everyone knew their assigned place and everyone knew what to do. And everyone bitched and moaned and all the higher powered executives complained about him and said, I don't have to do this. And he used his power because, you know, now he, they're going to listen to him or they're going to face consequences. So he made him do it. He made him do these rehearsals so it would build an automatic response, that muscle memory, if you will. So when and if a disaster happens, my guys are going to know what to do. He would time the employees with a stopwatch and he would stand there with his bullhorn and he would yell at everybody and everybody was getting annoyed with him and they thought he was this crazy and it, if he'd go too slow, he would lecture them, you know, he, you know, you need to pick it up. If this were the event of attack, you guys need to hurry. You need to take this seriously. Two by two down the stairs. Two you by can two picture down the people stairs. obnoxious later. Oh, like, especially God. those rich, yeah. high-powered New York execs. Hell yeah. Wow, what a visionary. He, he literally predicted 9-11. Yeah. They thought he was crazy, but eventually it paid off. In July 1998, he met his second wife. He actually met her. She was jogging, and he was running the opposite direction, and he was running barefoot down the street. Yeah. So she said, what are you doing? Like, she's never met this guy. And he hollered back. He said, I'm writing a screenplay about Africa, and they run barefoot, so I want to see what it feels like. And he had done that years before in Zambia, so they ended up falling in it's love. It's a good line. Yeah, but it was, it was true because <laughs> yeah, he was yeah. that kind of person. I'm writing a screenplay. <laughs> Don't mind me. Just write, remember when I was in Africa? Um, but they ended up having a very intense love affair. Uh, her, her name was Susan. So they ended up becoming married. She had three daughters, so he took on his stepdo- the stepdaughters, and they had a brief but passionate love affair. They ended up being married in 1990, and then they ended up moving um, 
to New Jersey together. So that was his wife okay. for the rest of his life. Again, during this time, just the kind of person he was, he liked Portuguese food, so he started learning to speak Portuguese so he could speak with the employees. Um, he was also learning to speak Arabic, and he was fascinated with the American West, so he was constantly learning that. He was practicing yoga, ballroom dancing, and, and Italian at the Jeez, same time. man. Just, I feel like such a lazy ass. Yeah, you should. Next, yeah. to, next to a kind of guy like this, just one of the best people you can be. September 11th, 19, I'm sorry, so September 11th, 2001. Rescorla woke up at 4.30 in the morning, of just course. like, uh, you know, just like he He's always does. He's got to take the train, right? His, he actually wasn't supposed to be at work that day. There was supposed to be a, an, an, another one of his employees was, wanted to visit Lebanon. Rescorla was supposed to be out of country for his daughter's, one of his stepdaughter's wedding, but yeah. they decided to hold off on their travels because one of his employees wanted to go visit family in Lebanon. Yeah. So he said, you can go and I'll stay and I'll go to his wife I'll, I'll, to, oh, to his, to his to the employee. Yeah. yeah. So he shouldn't have even been at the work that day, but of course he was. So his wife remembers him waking up and singing songs, you know, in the yeah. bathroom, getting ready for work. And then he took the train to work just like he always did at eight fifteen, He called his wife just to tell her he loved her, you know, just a normal kind of thing he did. At 8.46 on September 11th, a hijacked American Airlines flight struck the North Tower of the World Trade Center. He's in the other tower and he's watching this, right? So just like everybody in those buildings, they're going to hear the explosion and then they're going to see the tower burning. They're going to see this paper floating down on fire and they're going to see the chaos. So he immediately knows what's going on. You remember the panic and confusion, yes. just like we talked about. It was the same thing. No one knew if it was an accident. Nobody knew if it was, uh, you know, an intentional attack. That first attack, yeah, that nobody first knew. tower, nobody knew. The Port Authority actually announced over the radio to everyone in the building. Have you heard of this? Stay, stay, stay at your seats. Yes. They told everyone, stay at your desks. Stay calm. They, they even You're told people to go danger. back to your office. Go back to your office because they didn't want people trampling. There people. were people that were already out. Exactly. And they had to go back up. Exactly. But Rescorla knew exactly what was going on. He ignored the announcement. He grabbed his bullhorn and he grabbed his walkie-talkie and his cell phone and he began systematically ordering everybody out. He stood up on his desk on his bullhorn and he started yelling at everybody, get out of the building. Follow your training. Do what you're told to do. So everybody in Morgan Stanley snapped to like it was a training drill. Everybody stood up and they started moving two by two to the towers. While they're doing this, I'm sorry to the stairwell, the voices of the uh, Port Authority were clack crackling over the loudspeakers, telling everyone, stay put. Please do not leave the building. This area is secure. But Rescorla ignored them. No way. He actually called his friend Dan and he said, the dumb sons of bitches told me not to evacuate. They said it's just building one. I told them I'm getting my people the fuck out of here. And then he nice. moved into action. He started going around the office, making sure everyone got up, and he started directing people to the stairwell from that 44th floor. He started directing people to do as they train. And the employees are terrified at this point. Yeah. They know it's real. They've seen it. They heard it. It's on the news. People are crying. People are panicking. People are freezing. But he was the voice of calm. And his command presence with that bullhorn made people realize, if I follow his instructions, I might have... This crazy son of a bitch been talking about this for years. This is exactly what he told us yeah. is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, we right? thought he that, was crazy. There's no fear of the unknown. And just like he did in Vietnam, he started singing. So he starts singing over the bullhorn. He starts singing Men of Harlech. He starts singing these Cornish songs. So as these terrified employees are moving, they're hearing him sing and they're hearing his calm voice. And in between that, he's giving them commands and he's telling them, move two by two. And you and know what the crazy part? There's probably people going up past him. Yeah, maybe. You know? Probably not in these stairwells with the rush of people he's got going. Oh, yeah, because the elevators you know? are still going too. Yeah. But the inter all these terrified employees think what panic there should be, but they were moving just like they'd been trained, two by two. They're meeting in the hallways, and they're going down, almost like a battle buddy. When they started to panic, he'd give them encouragement and guidance, and he told them all, you're going to be okay. Do as you're trained. Just go down the stairwell, two by two, and they did. Because of his drills, they were orderly. No one trampled each other, and he would tell them, help each other. Help your fellow man. Help each other get yeah. to the bottom. So they started doing so. Throughout the bullhorn, he was announcing, he said, be proud to be an American. Tomorrow, the whole world will be talking about you. So rather than thinking of the fear and death, yeah. they're thinking of tomorrow and they're thinking of what it means. And then he started singing God Bless America over the, over the loudspeaker. So while other employees are trapped and they don't know what's going on or other employees to other businesses are, are being told to stay at their desk, these guys have a sense of purpose and they're moving down those floors. I wonder how many people saw that and were like, yeah, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Yeah. There was hundreds of people in another um, firm that were directed by his people where to go, and they, were, they survived because Damn. of that as well. At home, his wife was watching this on the news, and she's seeing the buildings, and she's terrified. She and she's, knows. She knows that he's going to die. And then as she's He'll watching, never walk out. she sees that jet hit the second tower, which she knows he's in. So she breaks down in tears, just collapses, thinking he's dead, right? A short time later, he What did up, it hit? The 40th? 
So I'm not sure what time. I think it was the 70th. 60th. It was above them. Something like that. But as soon as the, as soon as the plane hits, she knows he's dead because she knows he's in that tower. But shortly thereafter, he calls her. He's still alive because he's in that stairwell yeah. and he's escorting people down. He asked her if she was watching the TV, and she said yes. And he said, stop crying. I have to get these people out safely. And then he told her, if something should happen to me, I want you to know that I've never been happier. You made my life. And then he hung up Damn. the phone. <laughs> So she's sitting there, and of course she just broke down, yeah. sobbing because she knows she's never going to see him again at that point. Yeah. She knows she that knows there's he no way leaving. he's going to leave this place. So the employees continue to go down, and again these employees are in the stairwell when that second. Oh, second can you hit. imagine? So these they're f- afraid, but they're somewhat you know we're going to get out of here. And then the building shakes and lurches violently. This Dude, massive skyscraper. I wonder how violent the shaking was oh when my that God, one hit. Yeah. It has to be. Think of turbulence times a thousand. Yeah. You know? earthquake like, like times 10 dude people were screaming people were yeah. throwing people were stopping in the stairwell and then Rescorla the calmly got over the radio yes the lights went off Rescorla calmly gets over the bullhorn and he says keep moving you're going to be okay keep moving be brave be Let's strong get out of here and then he sang and he sang some more because of his actions most of the employees were already out of the building when that second plane hit most of Morgan Stanley's employees were already out and the rest were on their way out Again, 250 people for visiting uh, for a class actually got out, too, because the employees were able to help them out, and they were able to be guided by Rick Rescorla's actions. The rest of Rick Rescorla's morning is kind of shrouded in mystery, but he was seen all over. It can be pieced together by eyewitness accounts. Again, like you said, the the lights went out. There was fire raging. There was dark. The windows were shattering. Rick Rescorla moved upstairs before moving back down. He helped evacuate people above the 50th floor. He started moving up the stairs. When all his people were gone, he was seen everywhere from the 10th to the 72nd floor. He made it all the way up, and he would sweep through the buildings and then go to the next floor and then go to the next floor. And he's a very large, heavyset man at this point. He had cancer, and he was taking injections, and he was somewhat obese, but he's moving, and he's telling people to be calm. He's telling them, pace yourselves. Get off your cell phones and keep moving. But he was calm, and he was so calm that it was like that fatherly, fatherly yeah. voice that was, that was driving them home. At one point, he was so exhausted, he had to sit down on the desk, but he stayed on the bullhorn, and he kept giving people courage. He kept singing his songs, and he kept telling them to be brave and look out for each other. Morgan Stanley employees said that shortly before the tower collapsed, he called them, and he told them that he was going to go back in and look for stragglers. <laughs> that was his last uh, recorded One survivor remembers seeing him on the 10th floor. As they're coming down and they're panicking and they're trying to get out, he was sweating so much that he had completely sweated through his suit. He's just drenched. But he was telling people, you're almost out. You're almost out. Be brave. And they said he was making no effort to get down himself, you know, even though he was only 10 stories away. And that employee said, he was selfless in that situation. And that's your ultimate character test. He was not rattled at all. He was putting the lives of his colleagues ahead of his own. After successfully evacuating almost all of Morgan Stanley's 2,700 employees, 2,700 employees, he got almost all of them out. He went back into the building. And one of the employees grabbed him, and they told him, you need to get out of here, too. And he said, as soon as I make sure everyone else is out. As the towers burned, he rushed back in with three of his deputies. He was last seen on the 10th floor heading upward shortly, shortly before the second tower collapsed, and his remains were never found. Never? Never found. They didn't find most of those guys. So of the 2,700 employees of Morgan Stanley, six died, including Rick and his deputies. So three that weren't deputies. Holy shit. Because of his actions, because of his training. Because they would have stayed. Exactly. They wouldn't have known what to do, or they would have trampled each other, or they would have got stuck. He was declared dead three weeks after the attack. His body was never found. But again... Well, he was probably at the bottom of the pile. You know what I mean? I mean, everybody was in pieces at that point, but... Of everything that went on that day, the, the body count was about 2,700. It could have been easily much higher if it weren't for his actions. And it wasn't just his actions and his calmness. He drew up the evacuation plan. He got his colleagues to safety, and then he went back in to search for stragglers. In the 1993 attacks, he was the last man out, and he would have been that day as well yeah. had he not died. In That's action. why his wife was so shook. She exactly. knew. She Cause knew. Because she, she knew. You, when you meet those kind of guys, you just know. Yeah. Like, they're, they're, There's, it's over. It's the captain of the Titanic type of thing. If you, you know, know anybody's going in, you know it's going to be him. Yeah. And just, again. What a badass, just dude. Like, just like in Vietnam, he's going to do what he can to protect his guys. And, and he, he did, probably he loved every second of it, too. Yeah. To be, he sounds like one of those guys that's like, no, I, I'll, I'll go down with it. I doubt there was a way he would have rather died. Than yeah. That. But 
that's pretty epic. I never heard that story. It's a bit dark in here, Donnie. But, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, the that's that's they they made a one of the TV documentaries. It's called "The Man Who Predicted 9 11 Because yeah. not only was he cur- uh, selfless and courageous, he was brilliant, and he understood these things, and he looked, and nobody listened to him. Well, also he had that he had that thing where it was like he didn't give a shit what other people thought of him, which is <laughs> right. what mo- would keep most people shelled up. But there exactly. there might have been other people that thought about that, Can but they you didn't have the tenacity. A, an executive at a Morgan Stanley at Well <laughs> getting Trader. yelled at by some. VA Vietnam vet? Get in the hallway. No, I'm not. Get in the hallway over a bullhorn or, or what have you. And he ain't going to hear your shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's what he did. But How many times do you think that Morgan Stanley like CEO was like, God dang, yeah, should, should I take the power? Can somebody do something about this guy? And Why did I give him so much power? About? Yeah. The training prior to going in the military is what, what or the training prior to going to combat is what makes you survive Well, like combat. what you were the saying. training here is what kept these oh, guys What you were alive. saying about his guys training harder than everybody else around him? It's that same stuff, running the chow hall. Think of all the employees of Morgan Stanley looking at their buddies in the other offices or, you know, people they know, like, oh, you guys don't have to go down the stairs every oh, three months. I know. And you don't, oh, great. Now we got to go do another freaking fire drill. Like, I'm 10 years old. Yeah, for, that for five years, that six years. That saved their <laughs> life that day. Man, that's a good story. I've never heard that. Yeah, that's the story of Rick Ross. I've watched almost everything on 9 11, too. I've yeah. never seen that. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Yep. Man. Imagine how many cool stories there were from that day. Again, that, a million. That, there's, that a, there's, there's a million stories from 9/11. Every everybody in the country has their own story, and everybody that was in the towers or in the planes or the firefighters is going to have the most vivid that, stories. That, so. that documentary that the brothers produced. Yeah, dude, the firefighters. Man, if you guys haven't seen that, I, chaplain, I forgot what it was called. I'm not sure. But one brother was with one unit of the fire department. They had they're the only video that videoed the first plane hitting. Yeah, and from then, inside the building. And then they filmed from inside. You see, they're inside Tower 2 or Tower 1 when Tower 2 collapsed because Tower 2 collapsed first, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah the it second was hit one second hit. and it was uh, collapsed first. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. check those out. Yep. But man, what a great story. So that's, awesome. uh, that's another story of courage. This one's not a Medal of Honor story, obviously. Ah. It is a story of Vietnam courage. It is a story of military courage, but it's a story of a man of courage who, who brings that. That's a Medal of Honor story. It. Oh, absolutely. You know, I absolutely. mean, come on. On. That's saving. I mean, how, have we seen anybody that's saved <laughs> twenty seven hundred yeah. people? No, I don't. I don't think that's, that's pretty uh, crazy. That doable, but yeah, nine yeah, eleven, so, man. Yep. Appreciate you guys listening. Uh, it is the twentieth anniversary. Remember all the loved ones that were lost that day, and those that subsequently were lost in Iraq and Afghanistan and all over the world related to this kind of thing. And hopefully. I mean, it doesn't take a tragedy, but it, it would be nice if we could get back to those days following 9-11 where people looked Absolutely. out for and carried each other. And rather than, you know, fighting and griping and bitching and complaining and arguing, think of Rick Rascorla in the towers. Think of Rick Rascorla telling those employees, help each other. Yeah. Look out for each other, two by two, right? And don't wait for something crazy, tragically to happen for yeah. us to get to that point, yeah. you know? But exactly. that's what it usually takes. Yeah. Sorry about the lights. It got a little dark in here. Yep. But uh, might be a weird one to watch. But thanks for listening, guys. All right. We'll see you next time. Man of Aleph, stop your dreaming. Can't you see the spear points gleaming? See?